Second Thess. Oh, good, 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 good. Sarah's not well today. She won't be here. And Chantal's kids won't be here because for those who remember Joe and Iris, Joe passed away. You wouldn't know him. Joe, Joe Monroy, you remember him. So Joe passed away. So Chantal's and the kids are they're, they're distraught. They're not going to be here. So we're Lucas playing or Sarah. So no musical company other than our professional drummer and Bernadette. We'll, they'll make it work. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. So let's see. That was uh, who else? It was Albert, Joe. Someone else passed away. Who else passed away? Someone else passed away? Was there a third there? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's for sure. All right, Second Thessalonians, the thirty-first lesson. Maybe no, I don't know. Maybe it was thirty-one, thirty. Maybe it was thirty. Why did I say thirty-one? I don't know. I'm not sure. Hmm. I don't know. Whatever. Okay. Second Thess, let's open up Bible's first chapter there. And this is the, I put 31st, I think it's the 30th lesson, I think, on, um, on the New Testament review. And if you remember First Thessalonians, we went through that a couple of lessons. First Thessalonians was a great book. It's the first book that Paul wrote after getting saved. So it's a good book for early Christians to read, you know, new believers. And it deals with uh, really the second coming of Christ is the main theme. And the rapture, of course, is in chapter 4. And chapter 5 is a great devotional chapter, as I've said many times. Um, and then I went through the review last couple of weeks. Second Thess, again, the theme here is second advent. Uh, the first one, first chapter about the coming of the Lord, but really more for the Christian. Second Thessalonians is really more for the, kind of looking at it from the lost perspective of what's going to happen when they, when he comes back and the people that don't know him. So Second Thessalonians also deals with the second coming. So it's a, both books deal with that. It's written a couple of years after First Thess. It's, a, again, one of his early epistles. First Thess was the first one. This could very well be his second book he wrote like 54 A.D., very early on. Most of the other ones he writes that are later on. Romans is 58 to 60 A.D., and the prison epistles, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Jude are 64. Uh, not, not Jude, Philemon, they're like 64. So it's later on. And the book of Acts ends in 65 with him being killed. Um, all right, Second Thess chapter 2, let's look at it, verse 1. I mean, uh, I'll just read a couple <clears throat> verses. Pick it up verse 3. Verse 3, Second Thess 1, 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Well, that's, a good, that's a good charge, right? Yeah. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, which ye also suffer. Father, be with us and bless the teaching of this letter, this book, this epistle. Speak to our hearts, prepare our hearts for the message, and thank you for your mercy and kindness. Bring others in safely and have mercy upon uh, Iris and those affected by the passing of Joe Monroy and Chantal and her family and Rob and the whole bit, Lord, pray you touch their lives and affect them, Lord, for you. I know you saved and loved you, so I know he's with you. I just pray you'd watch over him. Have you in our life, and it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, Mickey, Mickey too, Brenda, Mickey. Mickey, Mickey, Albert, and, and now Joe. It's pretty close. You know. Well, I'm thinking those three. Yeah, March. 
All right. Anyway, that was three to five. Look at verse uh, six now. So the first one I put that we read was verses three to five. That's personal tribulation for a believer. We just read. It's a manifest token, it says, for the believer that you're worthy to suffer for his name, right? That's for us. Now, 6 to 10 is going to be the judgment on the world. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Wow. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Watch this. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and on them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the second advent when he comes back taking vengeance and flaming fire and them which know not God and obey not the gospel. What's obey not the gospel? You know, first, that's first Corinthians, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. You know, you're commanded to believe that. And so you're, it, the gospel is a, is a command to believe that. And those that don't believe it will suffer the consequences. Those that believe it get saved. You get saved but that form of doctrine in your heart. And he's talking about these people that rejected that. And these are going to come back taking, flaming, taking vengeance and flaming fire. You know, the God of love. You know, you want to get confused. If you want to get confused, and then get straightened out read the Bible. Because sometimes the Bible can confuse you if you don't get your head screwed on right and read it the right way. But this same God of love that died on Calvary's cross, that took the mocking and the beating and the whipping, and said nothing, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. The same one comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance. It's a righteous thing to seek tribulation to them that trouble you. See, with God, he can do anything he wants. You just got to get on the right side of the equation. God, see, God is merciful. He's kind. He's loving. He can also be vengeful and, 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 and destructive. You got to get on the right side. So when he comes back, you know, no one's going to argue with him. Oh, you can't do that. You're the loving Jesus. Get out of my way. You got, you, people don't realize that. They want to make him the little baby in the manger all the time. And make him that, you know, he's, it's just God's love. And God's love is powerful. That's what saves us. But when you read the Bible, you realize there's, a, there's more to it. And he's coming back. And I, we, again, you want to get on the right side of the equation. And I got to talk about that during my sermon, although it's not related to this but you'll see the same connection. So that's an important thing. Um, look at verse 9 again. Watch. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? You'll be punished because when they come back at that moment, you, you don't know the people, we were talking about that the other day, Phil, that have had opportunities to receive Christ. They don't. You pray, they get it. When they get it, they get it. And then sometimes you know, you're not responsible for bending somebody's ear or twisting their arm and putting, you know, at knife point, making them pray a sinner's prayer, because that won't count. That's under duress. It's not a free will decision. You got to lay out the truth and pray that they water it, that God would save, that they would, they would yield. They'd say, okay, we were talking about that today. The God he says Jesus is the Savior. Watch this, 1 Timothy 4.10. He's the Savior of what? All men. All men. Well, then, then everybody's saved. No, 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 no. He's the Savior of all men. Not all men believe. Some believe the things that were spoken. Some believe not. You have to believe. He's available. His gift of God, salvation is available to all. Available to all. Whosoever will, come and drink of the water of life freely. You have to be willing to take that step and say, save me. And then you're saved. Trust it. So that's what we're looking at here. So keep that in mind. All right, verse 8 and 9, that's judgment, second coming after the Lord's coming back. All right, look at verses 11 and 12. 
Now, this is for your personal walk right here, 11 and 12. Wherefore also we pray always for you, Paul's praying for the Thessalonian church, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's talking about your own personal walk with God, that you would bring glory to the Lord by the way you work. walk. Be glorified in you. So that's chapter 1. Again, so he's dealing with the second coming and the judgment that's going to befall the world that doesn't know him. We are fast approaching the day when the Lord is going to blow that trumpet and get us out of here. And when that happens, literally the expression, all hell breaks loose, that's what it means. Hell's going to be opened up, Revelation 9. It's going to break loose, and, and that's what's going to go on, and that we'll be out of here for that. But that's what's coming down the pike. You don't want to be here for that, nor do I. And we won't be here for that. It's not the time of the church's trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Who is Jacob? The father of Israel. That's, it's their trouble. It's their burden. Uh, look at chapter 2. Chapter 2 deals with this mystery. Now, let's look at this verse. This is very important. Let's get this now. Uh, look at verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, our coming, see again, the coming of the Lord, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand, that no man, say it, what? Deceive you. That's a mark of the end times. Deception. Deception is at an all-time high right now. Deception. That no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except to be a falling away first. Falling away, that's people who know the truth and fell away from it. Those are called backslidden Christians. That's the apostasy. Literally meaning you're falling from a standing position. Not talking about a lost world. It's talking to those that know the truth and have walked away. That's the falling away. I know more than I care to think about that have walked away. That know the truth whether in their mind or what, or heart, I don't know, but they don't, they're not here. They're not anywhere. Where are they? They're living in their own world, their own mind. Except they come a falling away first that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now watch, son of perdition, that's the Antichrist. Who, son of perdition, opposeth and exalteth above himself above all that is called God. This son of perdition is going to exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he... As what? Say it. He as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Look at that verse. Where's the temple of God? Yeah, that's where it's supposed to be. Where is it now? <laughs> it's nowhere. What's well, here, right? But there is the temple of God he's talking about here is the one in Jerusalem, but it's not built yet. So you read this, you make a deduction, you say, well, obviously the temple is a physical building in Jerusalem, not us. Christians, that's different. And he, this devil is going to go in there, sitting in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. It's called the abomination of desolation. Okay? So stand up. It's an image that stands up, made of wood, overlaid with gold, and, and it's going to make, it's going to come to life and speak. What's it going to say? Bow down and worship me. And they're going to realize that, and the Jews are going to flee through the wilderness and hide in the caves of Qumran, in the Judean wilderness, and wait for the advent. James, can you hear me? Can I hear you? Listen. And we love you, James, but listen, you gotta listen. Preach to 7 Eleven. But he's gonna go into that temple and sit there and demand himself to be worshiped as God, literally standing up and giving life to that image. That's a whole teaching I did on that. And that's gonna be that abomination, the desolation. That's what's going on. But this son of perdition, this man of sin, this Antichrist is going to, this image will come to life. Uh, now watch this. Verse 6. Verse 7. Here it is. For the, here's this, you make a note of this. This is one of the seven mysteries of the New Testament. We went over this in a Tuesday night class. I've mentioned it here. I'll mention it again. 
And for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Okay, mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let his leave be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, watch it, whose coming is after the working of who? Satan. Satan. Everybody see that? Verse 9. With all power and signs and lying wonders. He's going to use the ability to work miracles to deceive. Jesus used the ability to work miracles to convince people of who he was. There's a difference. Both are going to be the same thing. He's the Antichrist. He's so like Christ, you're going to miss it if you didn't know it. Christ is using miracles to show people he's the Messiah. This guy is going to work miracles to show people he's the Messiah, but he's the false Messiah. He's going to do it to deceive people. And by means of lying signs and wonders, he's going to deceive people by calling fire from heaven and working miracles. Because they're supposed to be the power of God. And they're going to believe him because they didn't believe the truth. We'll look at that in a second. But the mystery of iniquity shows up in verse 7. What are we talking about in chapter 2 here? It's the revelation of the Antichrist or that man of sin or that son of perdition which shows up in John 13, 26 when Jesus says to, Jesus says to John, look, the one who I give the sop to and he dips with me, that's the one that's going to betray me. Got that? That's John 13. You guys with me? He gives him the piece of bread and he, he, Jesus dips the bread in, in the sop and gives to Judas. When he dips it in, and Judas dips it in, and the moment he dips it in or he gives to him, that's the signal to John, he's the one that's going to betray him. The sop. Now, it's not a word we typically use today. Piece of bread. But isn't it strange, sop, S-O-P, son of perdition? If you take an acronym, son of perdition, that's who he's giving it to you. That's who it is. It's Judas. Judas is the Antichrist. Now, when he comes back, It'll be in the form of another person. I mentioned who I thought it could have been or maybe, but that person will embody that same spirit, will come into him. Just like the devil went into Judas in Luke 22, it says that he betrayed, he sought to betray the Lord, and he covenanted with the devil to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. Remember that? And the devil, look at it, Satan entered into Judas. The moment he did that, and he became the son of perdition. That's exactly what's going to happen here. But notice, notice verse 7, the mystery of iniquity. So what's, what's the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3.16? God was manifest in the flesh. The mystery of godliness is God manifest in the flesh. Come on. Mystery of iniquity, the opposite. Devil manifest in the what? Flesh. Come on. You guys got it? That's the mystery of iniquity. The devil's manifest in the flesh. The mystery of God is is God manifest in the flesh. Everything the Lord does, the devil tries to offset. The only thing he can't offset is God's humility. He can't offset the humility of Jesus Christ. He will never humble himself. Mystery of iniquity. That's one of the seven mysteries in the New Testament. Paul reveals six of them. So of the six that Paul reveals, this is one of them. The only one that Paul doesn't reveal is Revelation 17 that talks about mystery, Babylon the Great, which John reveals. Those are the seven mysteries of the New Testament. But again, mystery of, this mystery of iniquity doth already work. When Paul wrote that in 54 AD, it did already work because Satan was still out and about doing his thing. And Paul did not have advanced revelation as to how far the church age would go. So in Paul's mind, he believed the day of the Lord was at hand right then. And it could very well have been because the temple was still standing. You got to put this into perspective historically. He writes his 54 AD, the temple's still standing. Paul knows what I'm saying. This is what he's thinking. And when he's expecting the devil to appear in that temple declaring himself to be God, that would have been the signal for them. It didn't happen that way, as you know, and that's been 2,000 years ago. The temple got destroyed in 70 AD. So in 54 AD, they still had a chance the temple was there that this could happen right then. He, he believed he was living in that day then. We believe we're living near it right now. 
The difference with us is that Israel is a state again. They've been rejuvenated a second time. Isaiah 11, 11, I'll regather them a second time. There's no third regathering. There's no third regathering. It's only a second time. Isaiah 11, 11, a great verse. And they regathered a second time. And the signal for us, not only was Israel being a nation again in 1948, but the biggest signal, which we don't see yet, is the temple. Because there, need, there needs to be a temple for them to go into the temple. They have the plans for the temple. They have the equipment. They have the stone. They have everything ready to build it. They need a piece of cord. It's near the Dome of the Rock. They can't build that temple yet without a peace accord. Oh, lo and behold, what's going on right now this week in Egypt? Peace talks between Israel and Hamas being brokered by the United States and Syria, Israel, Egypt, and Jordan. Well, yeah, I mean, hopefully, Lord willing, if this is the right time, he'll go along with it. They'll come to some peace accord. And if they do that, get some even though when I say peace accord, I know it's temporary. But I'm saying from the world's position, if you get a little ceasefire and a peace accord in Gaza, and then there's the, the Palestinians get what they want, and let Israel build a temple, that's the signal, church. So when you see the trouble going on in the world, that's what I talk to him about all the time. That's what you're looking for. That's the next signal. When you see that temple being built, because that has to happen first before he can go in there and sit in the temple, declare himself to be God. I did a whole teaching on that uh, years ago out of Habakkuk. I can't go through it now. It's too in-depth. It's a whole other lesson. But he's going to go in there and declare himself to be God. And that's when that's the abomination and desolation spoken about in Daniel, in, Proverbs, in Matthew 24. He brings a stone, a wood image, carpenter, wood, overlay with gold. And it's going to sit, it's like the, you ever see the picture of uh, Abraham Lincoln in uh, the Gettysburg Address, sitting on the chair? You've seen it. Lincoln Building in New York City, I pass it every day. And you see him sitting there. Well, it's like that. DC too, of course. He's going to stand up and freak everyone out and speak. And it's like, wow, when that happens, that's a sign the Jews are going to scatter. Bow down and worship me. They're not going to do that. Even the lost Jews know that's wrong. Bow down to a temple, an idol, so they flee. By the way, I was, oh, I'll save it for sermon. Got a little nugget for you. So you want to notice a couple things. Deception is at an all-time high. Deception. That's a, a mark of the end times. The devil's in the flesh. Now, I read that to you there in verse, uh, in verse 4. And then again, verse, declare himself to be God, and he's going to work all powers and signs, lines, signs, wonder. Go with me to Revelation 13. Let's look at Revelation 13, 14. One verse, then we'll go back there. This is that false prophet that gives, that has power to work miracles. And verse 13, read that. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven. He doeth great wonders, they maketh fire come down from heaven on the sight, on the earth, the sight of men. That's pretty powerful, right? You're going to believe he's God. And deceiveth them, that's the purpose, that dwell on the earth by the means of what? Say it. Those miracles. That's why he's doing it. He's using miracles to deceive. Plain and simple. Christ used miracles to affirm who he was. The difference. Which he had by the miracles which he powered to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Wow, what a thing. What a thing, that's future, what's going to go on. Come back to 2 Thessalonians 3. All right, look at verse 15. Verse 15. Therefore, brethren, 2 Thess 2, 13, 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. So say amen. 
Hold on. Stand fast. Hold the, the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. By the way, that's one of the few times tradition shows up in a good manner. A lot of times the tradition of your father in Mark chapter 6 is negative. Or Mark 7. Wash the hands and the cups, but inwardly you're ravening wolves and dead men's bones and all that. Does negative traditions. This is a good tradition. And the tradition that he's talking about is hearing the word of God preached, going to church on a Sunday, and believing Jesus Christ and following, the, following what the apostles did. Those are good traditions. Uh, verse 16, look at 17. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. He's giving us a charge there again. All right? Chapter 3, look at verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and, the, and be glorified even as is, it is with you. That's a general charge for all of us. You pray, you pray for each other. Pray that the word is free course. Pray for the church. Pray for the message that goes out that people hear. Pray for each other. Verse 2, And that ye may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Watch it. For all men have not faith. Hello. That's why he's the Savior of all men, but not all men believe. Right there, all men have not faith. And that's true. You want them to have faith, but that's, so does God, but God doesn't force them. God doesn't force anybody to believe what he says. He's laying it out, and you have to come to him voluntarily, of your own volition. You can't be forced. All men have not faith. Acts 28, 24 says some believe things that were spoken, some believe not. All right, let's look at verse uh, 3. But the Lord is faithful. I'm sorry, not that one. Let's go to, let's go to verse 6. Now we commend you, brethren. Verse 6, let's read this one. Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition, again, which he received of us. That's a, that's a warning to not get sucked in with backslidden Christians. That's all he's talking about. In other words, you pray for them. Don't have fellowship with them. Don't hang out with them. Don't associate yourself with them when they're not right with God. Pray for them. Pray that they, you know, it'd be nice to have you see them, but you don't have to hang out with them. Let's go to the movies. Let's go hang out. No, no, it's all right. You, know. you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to be around someone that has willingly walked away from the truth. Unless you're going there for the purpose of trying to explain to them why they should come back to church or get right with God. And then after that, you leave. But don't get sucked back up in that orb. That's what the devil wants you to do, to take the energy out of you and waste it on someone who's given up on God. You can't force someone to love God. So you can pray for them. You pray, let God do things in their life to wake them up, open their eyes, Soften their heart to bring them back to Christ in Jesus' name. That's the prayer. Reclaim, I always pray, reclaim those that have wandered away. The Jack's Ranch was called the Reclamation Ranch. Reclaim those that have walked away. Bring a, some of them know the truth, they walked away from it. Some die in that condition. Some get sick. Some get right with God in that condition and come back. That's what you want to see. So that's the thing. He's commanding you to withdraw yourself. So don't, don't get... Caught up. Again, be friends. You can be kind to them. I'm not saying no, but don't, don't get caught up in that orb, there, there, that aura there. All right, look at verse, um, by the way, there's not a, lot of new, not, lot of not, not a lot of commandments in the New Testament. It's you're commanded to withdraw yourself. You're commanded to work. Command the work, you don't eat. So there's some commandments, not a lot, and that's one of them. But look at verse 12. Same right here, another command. Well, look, at, I'll read, read 11. We'll read 11 first. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. They're, 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 just, they're not doing their part. They're just gossiping and busybody. Verse 12, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work, and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. So you do right, 
Don't worry about what they're doing. Pray for them. And Galatians 9 says the same thing. Um, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Same thing, be not weary. In Galatians adds, we shall reap if we faint not. So you want to just continue to fight through weariness. You know, fill out that little, the little clip on the devil. And, it, you know, it talks about that. He wants to wear you out. He can't beat you, so he tries to wear you out. So you will be ineffective. What's the best he can do? He can't take your soul. You belong to Jesus Christ. If he could get you off course, get you involved in stuff you shouldn't do and die to disgrace the name of the Lord, that's the next best thing he can do, right? But as far as you, he can't take your soul to hell. So what could he do? He could he'd mess up your testimony, try to hurt you to, so you wouldn't be effective. That's what he wants to do. So, whom resist steadfast in the faith. That's what Peter says. Whom resist, the devil, steadfast in the faith. Resist him. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. He will what? Flee. Submit. Resist. He'll flee. So that's, that's what you remember. Um, verse 15. Yet, ver, okay, 14 to 15. Read it together. And if any man obey not our, wor not our word by this epistle, 14, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, make, make a note of him, and have no company with him that they may be ashamed. Now watch. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So he's talking to a backslidden saint who knows the truth and won't change. So you admonish him, but as a brother. You don't want to, he's not your enemy. He's backslidden, he's, you know, he or she is in their own world doing their own thing. But you don't, that doesn't mean... You don't get, you can't go into that sewer and pull them out. You can't change their mindset, right? You can, all you can do is stand fast, like we said, be an example, admonish them if the opportunity comes up, and then pray that they'd get, as I've prayed for years, and will continue to pray, that they would get turned their life back over to God and get things right. You're never that far gone that you can't get right with God. Right? I mean, you might seem that way, but you, it, it, all it takes, all it takes is a prayer. All it takes is some humility to say, Lord, what have I done? I messed up. Forgive me, Lord. That's all it takes is, is taking accountability of your own action. I'm sorry, Lord, I messed up. Forgive me. Wash me in the blood. I want to get right with you. Amen. And any Christians, any Christian worth his or her soul will be so happy to embrace you and say, come on back. Amen. Amen. Not gonna. Then uh, where did you go? How come you being back? Eh, didn't say anything to anybody. Come back. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're back. Then get back on the horse. And let's run the race with patience. Looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's what we got to do. But there's plenty of backslidden saints that 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 call themselves Christians. They say, "Oh, I'm a believer. I love Jesus," and they won't be found dead inside a church because they're too good for it. Or they they're beyond it now. They don't need it. They know enough. God help them. They're hurting people, hurting their families, hurting their testimony. And they have to come to see that. But as far as I know, admonish them, not as an enemy, but as a brother. I realize there's some that are backslidden, bad, and they do things. You say, well, maybe they're not saved. We always have that discussion in our mind. And the chances that they, the, the, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a slim chance that somebody might not be saved that you think is saved. Okay, I got that. I'm not going to go down that trail. I'm saying it could be. But if they're, if, they're, if they're not saved and they know a lot of truth, God help them. Come on. But if they're just backslidden and they ignored the truth and blocked out the Holy Spirit and are doing their own thing, you pray that they would wake up one day and repent. That's all it is. Listen, Peter was with the Lord for three and a half years. Walked on water, saw miracles. He denied the Lord. I mean, he's frustrated. He's angry. I got all that, you know. He's ready to fight for the Lord and put the sword away. And then he's warming his soul. But you're with him. I don't, I don't know who he is. I mean, imagine at that moment when he says this. I don't know who he is. I mean, Peter's convicted because he knows who he is. He, he's with him. He loves him. Three times. Oh, you're, you're one of his. Uh, he starts cursing. Leave me alone. Get the blank out of here. 
Then next thing you know, that rooster crows, boy, and it says, he remembered the words of Jesus and he wept bitterly. Because he wanted to get right with God. And he does get right with God. And he goes on to become a great Christian, a great apostle, and a big integral part of the New Testament, okay? So um, you're never so far gone you can't get it right. But what was the key? Peter remembered the words of Jesus and wept bitterly. He repented. That's all it takes of someone to get off their pride and say, I'm wrong, I messed up, forgive me. That's all it takes. I mean, God was going to blow, blow Nineveh up and, and they, they cried out. The king said, well, maybe he'll have mercy on us. And they put sackcloth and ash on and they cried out. Who knows? Maybe God will have mercy on us. And he did because they repented. He saw their works. What was their works? Repentance. God will do the same in your life. Say, Lord, forgive me. Wash me and let me get right with you. That's all it takes. The only the reason, it, the only thing that gets in the way of that happening is your pride. Hello? That's it. That's the only thing that stops anyone from getting right with God is their pride. I, no, I don't need that. I'm okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm saying I don't need that. I'm okay. You're not okay. No, I'm good. I'm good. And then I want to repent. Okay. Father, be with us. Bless this teaching. Give us all ears to hear what Spirit says to the church. Prepare our hearts for the message. Please bring others in that need to be here. Be with those who aren't feeling well. And be with Chantal's family and Iris for the passing of Joe. I know he's with you, Lord. But thank you now and open doors and bring others in safely. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.